So hi everyone. Uh, so my name is uh, Olivier Grisel. Uh, I work at uh, INRIA in Paris and uh, as part uh, some funding from the INRIA Foundation. Maybe it doesn't really work this. Okay, no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so and uh, basically I, I work as a software engineer to uh, to support the development of the Scikit-Learn project with a couple of colleagues uh, at INRIA and with the more generally uh, an inter international uh, community of uh, contributors around the world. Uh, so Scikit-Learn is a machine learning library uh, in Python. So how many of you uh, do not know about Scikit-Learn? I've not used Scikit-Learn in the past. Okay, a couple of uh, new people. So, um, so for th this presentation, what I would like to do is give a first introduction to Scikit-Learn for, for newcomers and then focus on some new features from the last release of Scikit-Learn, so it's O21, uh, especially the new gradient boosted trees uh, algorithm that were uh, uh, contributed, and uh, then give a demo on that, and uh, probably we won't have time to do much more, but if we have more time, I can talk also about other stuff that were also released in the past releases and uh, some ongoing work. So first, uh, Scikit-Learn and machine learning. So predictive modeling, uh, that we call also statistical machine learning, uh, is basically the, the process of uh, using uh, re repeated events that are recorded in the, in, in the database, so to keep uh, historical record and extract some uh, structure, statistical structures of, of those records, in order to, to turn them into some kind of executable model. Uh, so the end goal is to generate a program that will be able to predict the outcome of repeated events. So you can see that as an alternative to uh, hard coding rules uh, written by experts that know well about uh, the, the process that is being model modeled. But instead, we just use a record of data and hope that uh, this uh, executa executable model will be able to make uh, good predictions on future events. Uh, so it's uh, generally uh, most useful for small predictions, uh, small, uh, a large number of uh, small, uh, fast pr uh, small predictions that do not have a big importance if you make a, an individual failure, but you want that on average uh, your predictions are, are better than a, a random guess or, or some baseline rule that you could design uh, quickly. So, and, and then it can be used to optimize many business processes or scientific discoveries and so on. So the general data flow is to start from, uh, from the recorded data. So you have some acquisition process that could be based on uh, mobile phones, uh, cameras, uh, microphones, or uh, interaction with users via a web app. Um, and then all those, uh, these, those individual events, they are recorded in a database. And uh, the first step is to first uh, um, uh, find a numerical representation of those records. So those are the, the blue lines in this database. And you have one specific column that you're interested in, the, va the, the variable, the target variable that you want to predict. So this is the green one. Uh, sometimes it's naturally present in your database. Uh, for instance, if you want to do forecast of something, uh, you have the, the past information that is already there. Sometimes you have to uh, collect human annotations uh, for instance, if you want to do image classification or translation or, or th things like this, you need to have uh, professional annotators to, to, to give you so those labels. Once you have this, you can uh, plug any kind of machine learning algorithms. So those are mathematical models implemented in, in, uh, in Python or C++ or whatever. Um, and the outcome of that process is a statistical model. So the statistical model is some kind of uh, summary, it's a bunch of, uh, a couple of megabytes of parameters, for instance, uh, that kind of summarize uh, the big uh, training set that you used as the input. So typically the statistical models uh, are a couple of megabytes, or even uh, smaller, whereas the, the training set could be uh, possibly uh, gigabytes or terabytes uh, in some cases. Once you have this, you can, you can deploy it, uh, and basically, you, you don't need to recall all the, the training set. You can just uh, make a copy of that statistical model and deploy it on another server or on, or on a mobile phone and record new data with the same data generative pr uh, process, the same acquisition process, and then uh, execute the prediction algorithm 
uh, by feeding the new test record and the model to get the predicted outcome. So one typical example of this is to, if you are a real estate agency, uh, you can record the historical transactions uh, for housing, different housing types, and for each of those records, you collect numerical features or categorical features in different columns. So the number of rooms, it's an integer. Uh, the area in square meters is a, a continuous variable. The year is a specific kind of ordinal variable. And typically, you also have the target variable. In this case, it's the price in euro in a specific column. And you can also have new uh, records in your database where you don't have this target variable filled in because those are new customers that want to, to get an estimate for, for, for the, uh, the, the house that they want to sell. And uh, for those, you, by definition, you, don't, you do not know the, the, pr the price of the future transaction. So here the goal is to find the statistical relationships between the, the price and the, the descriptors in the historical data. And, the, and then use that statistical relationship to predict some estimate of, of the price. Oops. Uh, so the, the names that we will use for, for this, are, those are the features, the, the columns that we use uh, for the input. The target variable is the, the, the output of the model. Uh, and then the, the records in that database are what we call in machine learning the samples. And uh, so those where we have labels and we can use for training the models are called the training set. And the new ones where we want to make predictions are the test set uh, data. And once we collect the true value, we can compare the prediction uh, with the true value and, uh, and compute the accuracy of the machine learning model on the test set to do the, the generalization ability of the model, which is the, basically the, the quality of the model. So scikit-learn is a machine learning library. Uh, that has uh, hundreds of classical machine learning al algorithms implemented in it. Uh, so those are the traditional families. Um, and the goal is not to implement the latest st state of the art, but more like to provide a data scientist with good baselines that they could apply uh, on, on their data to, to, to build something useful out of it, or to compare if they have new fancy uh, ideas for better machine al algorithms, to compare that their new stuff is better than the traditional stuff. Uh, so it's an open source project uh, using the BSD license, so pretty much uh, anybody can use it. It's just that you have a disclaimer in case uh, you have a bug, uh, uh, you take your responsibility. Uh, with a community of uh, hundreds of uh, contributors, uh, now actually uh, a pair release, so I think it's more than 1,000 uh, so far. And uh, we have a team of our core, core developers uh, scattered around the, the globe uh, in Australia, in China, uh, in France, uh, mostly around in Ria, uh, in Germany, and uh, in the United States, uh, in Columbia University, for instance. Uh, so most of the algorithms are meant to be used from a Python API, and they are also sometimes implement, implemented with the Python programming language, uh, with the help of uh, numerical algebra, uh, linear algebra routines uh, made available uh, by uh, NumPy and SciPy. Uh, sometimes uh, the vector operations that are very efficient in NumPy uh, are not sufficient to, uh, to implement some algorithms, like for instance decision trees where the bottleneck is not really in, in a matrix, matrix multiplication. So in those cases, when we have nested for loops in Python, that can be very inefficient. So we use a compiled uh, programming language, which is called Cyton, which is basically a, an extension of the Python syntax that can be used to generate C code with types so that you can use a compiler to build a, a, a compiled extension for, for Python with a syntax that is very high level and you still have uh, NumPy operations and, and things like that uh, readily available in Cyton. Uh, the, the main selling point of the scikit-learn machine learning library is, is the fact that we, we, uh, we provide very mathematically heterogeneous models under a very homogeneous API. So data scientists can try uh, to swap the models very easily because they all follow the same kind of uh, API conventions, uh, the fit method for training the model, and then the predict and transform method to apply the model to new data. Uh, and because all the models follow this uh, standard API, we have standard tools to uh, evaluate the quality of the model for classification, uh, uh, measuring the accuracy, for regression, measuring uh, uh, the mean absolute error, and so on. 
uh, cross-validation procedures, model selection, hyperparameter tuning, and how to ensemble several models into a big model. And sometimes also to build pipelines uh, and so on with pre-processing. So <coughs> it's very, uh, a very active project. Uh, nowadays, I think we are in the uh, over uh, 800,000 uh, uh, monthly active users uh, browsing the, docu the documentation uh, online. And basically, it's uh, doubling every two years, approximately. So we estimate that uh, yeah, it's around uh, maybe a million of scikit-learn users or something like that. So what is new in uh, scikit-learn 021? So if you look at the, at the change log, uh, it's just a, a snippet. Uh, if you were to, to, to scroll the, the, the page and, and, and take screenshots, it would cover the walls, basically. Uh, so I will just focus in, in a subset, uh, and in particular, I will focus on the, the new uh, gradient boosting implementation in scikit-learn. So gradient boosting is uh, a very, very useful uh, supervised classification model. It's based on, on decision trees that you train sequentially one after the other, such that a second decision tree tries to correct the prediction errors of the first one. And you, and you uh, build an ensemble by uh, sequentially uh, re re refining the predictions uh, using different uh, uh, trees. Uh, so in, in scikit-learn previously, we already had an implementation since approximately eight years or something. Uh, but uh, the, the way it was implemented was implementing the, the traditional exact uh, method. Uh, but this traditional exact method was shown to be completely uh, uh, deprecated by a new approximate method implemented, uh, for instance, in uh, the, uh, another C++ project called uh, LightGBM by Microsoft uh, and other libraries like XGBoost. But in particular, uh, LightGBM could show that you could get really, really high performance uh, by, uh, by what we call bin binning the data uh, uh, in a, a small number of buckets and computing histograms for the frequencies of uh, when you see this data point with this value and the to compute frequencies. And this makes it possible when we train the decision trees to not have to uh, do uh, sorting operations that are very expensive in the, in the traditional uh, algorithm. So because we do that, we can get rid of sorting and we just do comparison operations and counting operations and this is much, much more scalable. And furthermore, the binning step itself can also uh, improve a bit the quality by adding some regularization. So to, to implement this for scikit-learn, we first uh, started to, to do it as a, some kind of prototype using the Numba uh, framework, which is basically a just-in-time compiler for scientific programming. Uh, because I wanted to, to, get, uh, to, to get, find a good opportunity to learn how to use Numba. And so this was implemented in this project, which is also open source, but just as this single algorithm implemented with Numba. And, and after that, once we could prove that uh, we could reach this kind of, uh, of performance with Numba, uh, we decided to translate the code into Cyton, which is very similar to Numba. We just need to have uh, additional uh, the type declarations, basically, so that it can be easily be uh, embedded in scikit-learn that already has a dependency on Cyton. And we didn't want to introduce a new dependency uh, uh, quickly. So maybe in the future scikit-learn we use, use Dumba, but it was uh, easier for the, for the short term to just translate it. But we still plan to, to keep uh, this uh, PyGBM project uh, around, uh, so if you are interested in, in Numba and gradient boosting trees, you can still use that directly. Uh, the, the two projects have the, basically the same performance, and uh, the, the, when we measure on some benchmark data sets, for instance, uh, uh, the Higgs boson data set, uh, it's, uh, it's quite uh, competitive with LightGBM, uh, which is very optimized C++ uh, implementation. Sometimes it's even a bit faster. Uh, so the, the Cyton tr translation was actually uh, contributed by uh, Nicolas Hugues at uh, Columbia University, and, and we are still working together to uh, integrate the missing features. So this slide is uh, slightly uh, outdated. Now we have more losses. We can do classification with uh, multi-class. Uh, we still want to have uh, new uh, losses for quantile regression and, and so on to support sparse data, support missing values, which is almost ready to merge, 
uh, and there are other features like this from LightGBM that are not yet uh, present in Scikit-learn, so we are still working on that. Just to give you uh, uh, some intuition of, of, of how Numba uh, makes it very easy to do high-performance uh, uh, algorithm in, uh, in pure Python, so this is actually a, a snippet of the code for the binning part. So to, uh, to go from continuous values to integer values in, in buckets. And so this is a very naive algorithm, but there is no, it's the traditional way to, to write binning and there is no obvious way to do better. Uh, but if you do that in Python, you see that you have two nested loops. It's, ve it's very uh, inefficient. Uh, but if you just import number and the NGIT operator, uh, and you decorate your function like this, then Numba will use LLVM to, uh, to do a native version of this code and to compile it specifically for your platform. And this will run as fast as C++, basically. And furthermore, if you use the PRANGE function here, you see that the, f uh, the for loop will change the range operation with PRANGE. And automatically, by doing this, you get a parallel execution of the for loop. So you can do in diff different threads on uh, multi-core machines, uh, the uh, independent operations in different threads, and, and get a, a good speed up because of this. Uh, so with Cyton, it's very similar. It's just that we need to have additional types, uh, so it wouldn't fit on the slide anymore, but uh, uh, it, the, the code would be very, very similar anyway. So the, the Cyton implementation is still flagged as experimental in scikit-learn, so, uh, because we, we plan to implement more features in it, so we know that we are, are going to need to change maybe the behavior of the default uh, hyperparameters. So because of that, and we are very conservative in scikit-learn not to break our user's code, if you want to use uh, the new histogram of great and boosted classifier, um, you, you need to acknowledge in your source code that you are using an, an experimental features and uh, that for this specific model, we do not guarantee uh, backward compatibility with, uh, with the deprecation cycle. Um, we will not break it for fun, it's just uh, we will probably just change uh, the uh, s small behavior for the default hyperparameters. So we, we still need to implement sample weights, sparse data, uh, missing values is almost ready, categorical variables and so on. Uh, but it's already usable for, for numerical values or if you pre-process your data to uh, only have uh, just numerical values. Uh, so from a performance point of view, if you benchmark this, uh, this is a classification uh, problem with, I think, 20 features, and uh, uh, it's a synthetic classification problem. Uh, and you see that uh, on the x-axis, you have the number of samples from uh, uh, hundreds of thousands to millions. I think uh, the last point is 5 million, so it could go to 10 millions, but on this laptop, it was uh, uh, using too much memory in the end. Um, you see that you have this kind of uh, linear scalability, so this is a log-log plot. On the y-axis, I missed the label, uh, but it's the time of in seconds. So you see that for 50 million uh, data points, it takes approximately 10 seconds to train a typical uh, ensemble of, uh, of trees on, on this using this algorithm. So the blue line is, is scikit-learn. The orange line is uh, light GBM, so you see that for small data sets, we have some override in scikit-learn because we do uh, additional input validation, I guess. But then when you move to large data sets that uh, last for more than one second, uh, we are very competitive with uh, light GBM and uh, uh, significantly better than XGBoost. So they don't have exactly the same hyperparameters, all, all uh, XGBoost and light GBM, uh, so it's hard to compare exactly, but uh, uh, this is the kind of performance that you can expect. So I would like to, to switch to some interactive demo. So here I have a Jupyter notebook uh, where I will show how to use scikit-learn basically uh, in a typical use, uh, use case uh, and compare the different uh, solvers and in particular focus on gradient boosted trees. <coughs> so. Uh, the data set, oops, sorry, I was not at the beginning, okay. So the data set that I'm going to use is what we call the California housing data set. So it's a small uh, real estate uh, data set where you have uh, 20,000 uh, samples, so it's uh, not very big. And you have uh, those features to describe a different housing type. And the goal is to predict uh, the, pr the price uh, of the houses in different uh, neighborhoods. Um, See, it's all numeric data. Um, 
So first, we split the data set into a training set and a test set so that we can measure the quality on the test set and not cheat uh, by just memorizing the, the prices uh, that we have observed on the, on the training set. So first, we will just use a linear regression baseline. So it's possible with scikit-learn to, uh, to, to do linear regression like in Excel. Uh, and it's very fast. You see it's uh, 11 milliseconds. And we can compute the, the error. Uh, so it's the mean uh, absolute error. So uh, I don't remember the units, but it must be uh, uh, several tens of thousands of dollars or something like that. Uh, and so you see that uh, on the training set, the error is slightly lower than the, on the test set, which is kind of expected. Uh, we, it's easier to memorize than to generalize. Uh, and you see this number, so it's just a baseline. We can also do uh, this kind of plot to compare uh, the, the, the predictions on the x-axis to the true labels that we wanted to uh, predict on the test set. And you see that if you have a perfe uh, perfect model, uh, all the points should be on the diagonal. They should be the identity function, basically. Here you see that there are many off-diagonal elements, and especially for the large values, uh, our model tends to under-predict the, the, the large values. Um, it's, it goes off-diagonal. There is this kind of bias. So this is probably because we have this kind of distribution for the true labels. So this is the distribution of the, of the prices using a histogram. And you see that there is this kind of uh, censoring effect at uh, 5, uh, which means that basically um, uh, uh, housing uh, above this price were uh, censored, were limited, and so in, in the database just recorded 5 instead of uh, more than 5. Uh, so this is an artifact of the training set, and for linear models, it, it can actually be a, a problem because the loss function that they use uh, does not make this kind of assumption. Uh, so what we can filter out this, and we can also take uh, the logarithm of that so that it's more like Gaussian distributed, and see if uh, our linear regression can perf perform better in this case. And we also make a pipeline where we do some uh, standard preprocessing, linear regression uh, on the on the data that has been. Uh, uh, pre-processed, on the labels that have been pre-processed. So if we do that and we compute the scores again, uh, when we compute the scores, we need to uh, inverse the pre-processing that we did on Y, but uh, uh, you see that it's uh, significantly better uh, already. So just using a, a linear model, uh, let's say, m more correctly, we can see that we, we already improved the, 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 the predictions by quite a bit. So let's see if we can use a nonlinear model to uh, gain some more expressive power. So uh, in scikit-learn, you can build complex pipelines where you do a transformation of the data. For instance, in this case, uh, we will do polynomial feature extraction. So we will keep the original uh, numerical features, and we will do also pairwise interactions, and actually up to five degrees uh, interactions between, uh, between the numerical values. And then after this uh, feature expansion, basically, we will fit a final linear model. But the full pipeline is no longer a linear model. It's more complex, so it's more expressive. So th this takes significantly slower uh, because the four, four seconds instead of 11 milliseconds. Uh, but you see that uh, the, it's more and more diagonal. You, you no longer see this kind of extreme uh, deviation uh, uh, pessimism by, by the model. So instead of doing feature engineering to turn a linear model into a, a nonlinear pipeline, what we can do is directly use a nonlinear model like a neural network. So it's a kind of a generalized uh, linear regression with built-in uh, nonlinear capabilities in it. And if we do that, it's also more expensive. So in scikit-learn, we have basic neural networks uh, so that you can use. Uh, if you really want to use neural network, I would advise you to rather use uh, Keras or TensorFlow or PyTorch because they are, you have more flexibility to design the architecture that you want. But if you just want to use the traditional MLP architecture, you can use a scikit-learn uh, on the CPU. And here you see that the accuracy is getting better, uh, even uh, slightly better than the, the, the feature extraction that we did uh, manually with the pipeline. So it's uh, 0 0.21 on the test set. And the, the training time starts to be slow. It's eight seconds now. Uh, so we can do, again, the, this uh, plot. And you see that it's more and more diagonal. It's still not perfect, but it's uh, slightly better than uh, what we did before. 
So finally, uh, gradient boosting. So whenever you have this kind of tabular data, where, where you have uh, some kind of Excel spreadsheet with different, different columns with different units, physical units, like a number of rooms, the criminality in the neighborhood, whether or not it's close to a public transportation, whether or not it's close to the ocean, uh, the GPS coordinates. Those are different columns with very different heterogeneous uh, types, uh, t uh, physical units. So this is what we call tabular structured de uh, data. And for this kind of data, uh, typically neural networks are not significantly better than uh, traditional machine learning. And in particular, decision trees and gradient boosting is very, very competitive and most of the time significantly faster and less finicky to, to adjust. So if you have this kind of tabular data, this is the, the kind of uh, machine learning algorithm that we would recommend to try uh, uh, very quickly. It's always good to start with a linear model, but then very quickly try this one to see if it's better. So this is gradient boosting, the traditional ones that were uh, previously implemented in scikit-learn. Uh, so the, the exact algorithm. So you see that it's taking a bit more time, but uh, six seconds. And this is with the original data set we, uh, without fil filtering the, the sensor stuff. And you see that it's already much closer to the, to the, to the diagonal. And the, the test error is even uh, smaller than with the neural network. And it's, it's easier to find the good hyperparameters with, with this algorithm. So uh, also something that is interesting to note is that if you uh, serialize the, the trained model, it's not very big, it's, it's uh, 1.5 megabytes, so it's easy to store on your disk and to deploy on servers, to load in memory on many servers, to run predictions uh, on, a, uh, on a compute farm or even in mobile phones. They are small models most of the time. And uh, if you make predictions, you can uh, time uh, how to predict for a batch of 100 samples. You see that to predict for 100 uh, houses, it takes uh, just a couple of hundreds of microseconds, so less than one millisecond. So they are also very fast to predict. So this is a good feature for deploying this kind of model of production in production. You can contrast this with the random forest, which is another way to, to build ensembles of decision trees, more traditional and maybe more popular in the past. Uh, so uh, from a fitting, from training time uh, point of view, it's kind of equivalent. From a test uh, error point of view, you see that it's very similar. See, it's a 019, and here it was a 0187. So it's very uh, close. Uh, typically, gradient boosting tends to be slightly better than a, gra a gradient uh, a random forest. Uh, but the, the big difference is the size of the model that you get. Uh, for random forest, you generally build much deeper trees. Uh, so they take a lot more space in memory, and furthermore, they take a, a lot more time to predict. You see that it's hundreds of milliseconds to, to do the same prediction. So it's a uh, uh, hundred times slower than the, the gradient-boosted trees. So this is why, the, typically in production, people will tend to, to favor gradient-boosted trees rather than a random forest. You can uh, reduce the inference cost, basically. So now in scikit-learn, you also have this. Uh, the new hist histogram-based gradient boosting trees. So you can do the same, and uh, uh, what you will observe is that typically for the small data set, uh, the, the training time is very similar because uh, on, small, on small data set, uh, it doesn't make a big difference. The accuracy is very similar to the traditional uh, gradient boosting algorithm. The model size is slightly bigger because just for this run, maybe it has built uh, slightly more trees, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, but uh, this is not very important, and it's, uh, it's uh, quite fast also to predict. Uh, <coughs> something that is very interesting is that if you use that on a uh, data set with millions of data points, then the traditional method that I've uh, demonstrated before would not work at all. It would crash, it would use too much memory, and it would be much too slow. Uh, whereas this one would have no problem uh, with tens of millions of, uh, of data points. It would take uh, between uh, tens of seconds and a couple of minutes, uh, depending on the hyperparameters. And something else that is very interesting with uh, histogram of gradient boosted trees is the ability to do early stopping. So uh, remember that I said that uh, um, uh, we train one sequential, uh, we, we train the trees one after the other to try to fix the errors of the previous tree. Uh, so we can, when we do that, we can keep on monitoring uh, the 
the train and validation error of the model. So this is on the x-axis, it's the, the number of trees that we put in the ensemble. And uh, on the y-axis, it's uh, the, the, the score function, basically the higher the better. Uh, the negative error in this case. So you see that uh, when you add more trees, the training accuracy basically increases, and the validation accuracy on the held out validation set is also increasing, but at some point, it's, it's reaching a plateau, it's making no longer good uh, significant improvement. So what, we, what uh, early stopping does is basically computing this uh, accuracy on the validation set after each tree, such that whenever you detect that you are reaching this plateau, you stop. And by doing this, here you see we stopped before uh, reaching one, 100 uh, trees, so it's smaller than before. Uh, we can build uh, smaller models that are faster to train because we do, do not need to go to the, to the end, and faster to predict and smaller to store uh, in memory or on the disk. So it's uh, very good uh, to, to, to use early stopping uh, in practice. Okay, I will stop here for the demo so that I have some time left to, to talk about other things in, in scikit-learn. Uh, so, in the, in the previous release of Scikit-Learn O20 that was uh, published uh, in September or October last year, uh, there were also a bunch of uh, very cool features uh, that some people might not necessarily know in this room. And in particular, uh, one that I would like to highlight is the column transformer. And there, uh, there was a lot of effort uh, done to make it much easier to do uh, feature engineering, uh, typically on uh, heterogeneously types, uh, typed uh, pandas data frames, so with columns with categorical variables, columns with numerical variables, uh, uh, different distributions, and so on. Uh, there were also other improvements, but uh, those are the ones that I would like to emphasize. So, for instance, here we are using pandas to read a CSV file from uh, the Titanic dataset. So, it's the, li the list of all the passengers of the Titanic with a specific column that uh, highlight whether or not the, the passenger has survived the Titanic, the Titanic or, or not. And so we can uh, introspect the different columns of this data frame and, and look at the data type, the data type of the, of the data frame, whether or not they are integer or, or floating point values. And if, if they are integer or floating point values, we say that this is a numerical column, numerical data. If it's uh, not integer or floating point, for instance, if it's a string, an object, or something, it's probably uh, uh, the label of a categorical variable. Uh, at least it's the case on, on this data set. So w because, uh, because of that, we decided to split the columns into two groups, the numerical ones and the categorical ones. And then we can use this uh, make column transformer method to, to define two different pipelines one that will apply for the numerical values and one that will apply for the categorical values. So for the numerical values, we will do a missing value imputation with the median. Whenever there is a missing value in, the, in, uh, in a record in, in one of those numerical columns, we compute the median for the non-missing ones in the same column and we put that instead. We can also insert a new uh, indicator column to say that we have done this uh, imputation. And then we will use the uh, numerical preprocessing tool, which is called KBIN's discretizer, that I will present uh, in the next slide. So this is the pipeline for numerical values, and we can do a similar pipeline for categorical values, but in this case, the missing values, we, we cannot compute the median, because a, a, a category is just a, a, like the, a, a name, a label. So in that case, we just fill in with a constant value, which is missing. And, and that's enough. And then we use the one-hot encoder, dummy uh, categorical uh, value encoder. And, uh, and, and then we can combine the two pipelines uh, using the column transformer and call that the resulting uh, operation, the preprocessor. Uh, once we have this preprocessor, we can make a final pipeline that uh, stage the, the preprocessor first and the classifier second, the logistic regression in this case and we can pass this full pipeline to a cross-validation uh, procedure that will do the, the model evaluation of the full uh, set of decision, modeling decisions, basically. And if you do that, you see the accuracy that you get uh, is uh, 81, which is a, like a good, very good baseline for, for this data set. And you see that the code that we had to write to, to do this level of flexible preprocessing is uh, kind of limited and, uh, and uh, still uh, very uh, easy to understand. 
So the, the, the numerical pre uh, preprocessing that I mentioned is the Kevin's discretizer. So this is interesting because uh, on this, we have three different data sets. Uh, so the first data set, you have the, the purple points and the green points that are arranged into uh, overlapping uh, folded half moons. So the goal here is to, based on the position in this 2D space, the position is the input for the model, and the color of the dot is the output that we want to predict. So basically the goal of the model is to generalize the color basically to all the possible locations in this space. And on the first column, you see that we fit a logistic regression classifier, which is basically a linear classification model. So it will try to, to find a linear boundary into that 2D space to separate the two classes. And when the two classes are overlapping like this, you see that it's not possible to use a linear model for that. For, for the last row, you see that the two groups are approximately separable. So in this case, the linear model is uh, optimal. But for the other data sets, the first two lines, it's not possible to use a, a linear model and, and get good performance uh, in, this, in this case. Uh, but what we can do is use the K-Bins discretizer as a preprocessing stage before the linear model. And this, in this case, we will group uh, values between ranges of uh, possible values and output more features. So we will generate a higher dimensional sp feature space. And if we do a linear decision boundary in that higher dimensional feature space, then it, it corresponds to a, a, a nonlinear decision boundary in the original feature space. And this is what we observe. So the, the second column is the combination of uh, Kevin's discretizer with li linear regression. And you see that uh, uh, logistic regression. And you see that the quality, even on nonlinear problem, is uh, very good. And this is a very fast model. So you can compare to gradient boosting and uh, support vector machines that are also nonlinear by nature. So they can solve this classification problem quite easily, but uh, the first one is significantly faster and smaller to, to deploy. So in this case, it would make sense to just do this kind of preprocessing plus a linear model, and that would be enough. Uh, so there are other features that were introduced. I will skip those. Uh, to just highlight that when we worked on that, we, l we also fixed a lot of things directly in into the Python standard library for the serialization of large objects with NumPy arrays uh, to work on a distributed uh, computing cluster. So it's also important to keep in mind that uh, the Python ecosystem is a community, and when you work on your, on your project, it's sometimes you want to, to quickly fix uh, and hack uh, stuff uh, on your project, uh, but sometimes it's, uh, it's better to, do, to make the investment to, to fix the problem upstream so that other projects can benefit from, from the solution. So this, uh, we improved uh, the Pickle module uh, uh, over a span of two years, and uh, now it's going to be integrated in Python 3.8. Uh, so I would like to just go to the end. And uh, thanks to the, the partner uh, of the INRIA Foundation who, who supported the, the, this work, and thanks uh, more generally uh, the scikit-learn developer community and users community. So you see uh, pictures of the uh, last couple of sprints, international sprints, in, in Paris, in Austin, and in New York. Uh, so, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Maybe we have a couple of minutes for one or two questions. So there is a microphone here. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. Are there a slide somewhere and the uh, IPython notebook available? Uh, I will, they are already uh, online, but uh, I need to tweet the URLs. Uh, I, I will tweet them. Uh, my Twitter is ogrizel, O G R I C L, and probably that the conference organizers will, will collect the slides and put them uh, on, on the page of the website. Basically. Okay. And the second question, you introduced like few algorithms, one after another in a IPython notebook, and uh, random forest was the last one. Mm -hmm. But the random for and you said it's used in production very often, but the random forest often overfits from my experience, so. Okay. Uh, the random forest can overfit, but mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily the case. Though typically in random forest, the more trees you put in the random forest, uh, you, the lower you will overfit. So. By putting more trees, you can decrease a bit the overfitting. Mm -hmm. You can also limit the depth of the trees using max depth in, in scikit-learn. And you can also do some kind of feature selection to remove the features that are not predictive and, uh, and uh, that will help also uh, combat overfitting. So sometimes you have a lot of noise in your data and, uh, and there is no perfect solution, but mm -hmm. generally, uh, 
I would say that it's possible to reduce the overfitting with a random forest. The, the main problem with random forest is that they are much bigger model and they are slower to predict compared to gradient boosting, mm -hmm. like uh, in the new scikit-learn or in XGBoost or in LightGBM. Those models are, are smaller and faster to predict, so this is why they, are, they tend to be uh, favored in, in production. Okay, thank you. Another Hi, question? my name is Björn. Um, <coughs> I have a question for your column transformer. Yes. Like, so basically it seems like you have now attached pandas to work directly with sklearn and you don't have to transform everything to like a NumPy matrix before you input it. Yeah. And that basically there was a tool called sklearn pandas. Uh, before, yeah, exactly. Right? This so you was don't need that anymore. The, uh, yeah. This sklearn pandas was basically a, a big inspiration for, for the column transformer. Uh, so we wanted to have something similar by default in scikit-learn, and this is where... Yeah, that, that's really great, because when I started to learn SK, uh, SK, uh, scikit-learn, mm -hmm. I was really a bit put off by that, and yeah, yeah. Found this it makes it much pandas, easier to, uh, yeah. to do feature pr uh, engineering f from original data that was loaded with pandas, yeah. and uh, <coughs> in the future, this could also probably be adapted to work with other kind of uh, tabular data structures. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's great, thanks. <coughs> Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, just a question regarding the support of categorical variables. You said it's like ongoing. Is there a timeline? Uh, okay, so uh, so there are two ways to support uh, categorical variables. Either you do pre-processing like uh, we uh, showed with the column transformer, and that will work for all the models in scikit-learn. Okay. And you have much more flexibility on putting some business logic, like filtering the rare events or stuff like that. And we plan to improve the... Uh, so, so far we have one hot encoding for linear models on this kind of our neural network. Uh, but we also have ordinal encoding, which is better yeah. typically for decision trees. Um, but in the future, we want to have impact coding that use the target variable to also uh, find a good representation and uh, better support for uh, weird distributions of rare values. And sometimes you could also have uh, labels that are informative, cat uh, categorical, uh, uh, lab category labels that have typos but are yeah. almost words. And for this, there are a third party project like uh, Dirty Cat that are meant to be used, uh, used in scikit-learn pipeline to improve this and to do uh, this kind of categorical variable um, pre processing. And then for uh, decision trees, uh, it's possible directly inside the decision tree to, to deal with categorical variables. So this is not yet implemented. Uh, right now we are focusing on missing values. Okay. And uh, there are a couple of other stuff that are of more priority, like sample weights, but I think this is. Uh, after that, in the coming months, uh, we plan to work on this. Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, can this um. new, new algorithm work on uh, GPU units? Uh, so, uh, for most of the scikit-learn uh, solvers, they, they depend on either NumPy or Cyton, and those libraries, they do not support working with uh, GPUs uh, right now. Um, and furthermore, some models will not really benefit from uh, GPUs. Like, for instance, linear models, they are memory bound and they would not really benefit from GPUs, so there is no, really no point in trying to, to use GPUs for them. But uh, there will be a presentation by uh, NVIDIA uh, later uh, today and maybe another one on Rapid AI. I don't, I don't know, uh, one on desk and one maybe another one on... on uh, yeah, I'm not sure. You will see on the program or you can ask Peter here. Uh, that basically provide similar estimators uh, to, uh, to scikit-learn, uh, a compatible API. Uh, it's not necessarily an exact drop-in replacement, but uh, basically sim similar features. And some of them can really benefit from, uh, from uh, running on the GPU. Uh, for, for decision trees, for gradient boosting, it's not always the case that running on the GPU will be faster. So you have to keep in mind that it's not as for ne uh, neural network, uh, that uh, really, like convolutional neural network, really benefit from GPUs. For decision trees and for linear models, uh, sometimes the CPU is, is good enough, so, yeah. Hi, um, thanks for the very informative talk. Maybe you can quickly comment on regularization. You mentioned L2 regularization mm -hmm. in the prototype. You're also planning yeah. to include the others, like L1. So b basically, when we do the binning uh, preprocessing, is we are simplifying the representation of the data because we are decreasing the precision. We're using 8-bit uh, integers on uh, 256 levels to represent the original values that were uh, encoded in 64-bit float, for instance. 
Uh, and by doing so, we uh, reduce the complexity of the model. And so this is kind of uh, a kind of regularization. So for decision trees, it can help a bit, but it's not magical uh, in any way. So, uh, but sometimes you observe that by doing this approximate method, you get better performance than the exact method. So this might be a bit surprising, but it's caused by this uh, regularization effect. Uh, I don't know. I think we should st stop here because uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We are running out of time. Okay, thank you very much again.